welcome back to Overused Dictionary Corner, where we dissect words that the internet, and usually Twitter and TikTok, are misusing so loudly and so often that they're in danger of becoming completely meaningless. Which is bad, because, as I have said before, say it with me folks, words have to mean things. You may notice that I'm not in the corner with the beanbag and the books and the stuffed toys. That is because my room is in the attic, and we're currently in a heatwave. So even if I wanted to move all the equipment back upstairs, I'm not convinced it wouldn't melt in the time it took to film this. So, without further ado, word number one on our wheel of weirdness today, hyperfixation. Hey, guys, not everything is a hyperfixation. Cool? Moving on, word number two. No, I'm just kidding. I obviously have to go into this a bit more. Hyperfixation, and by extent, hyperfocus, is a trait usually seen in people with neurodivergencies such as anxiety, ADHD, autism, and is defined by a sudden obsessive interest in something, whether that be a person, show, book, thing, hobby, album, etc., etc. But the key thing about being hyperfixated on something rather than just interested is that you are incapable of tempering that interest in any way. It is an obsession. It's all you think about. It makes brain go wee, and sometimes. Sometimes these obsessions can last for a few days, but sometimes it's years at a time. My hyperfixation on the 100 went from 2017 to 2020, and it got so bad that I posted a million words of fanfiction about the main characters to archive of her own in under two years, basically turned my Tumblr blog into a blog exclusively about the show, made numerous playlists both about individual characters and pairings, and wanted to make every conversation about it to the point where, after a while, my mum put a moratorium on it. I could talk about the show for half an hour, but then we had to talk about other things. Now. I don't regret this time, insofar as its effect on me. I definitely regret it in terms of how disappointingly the show ended. But you can't exactly say that's a normal response to something. I once left a lecture to go to the bathroom just so I could watch the trailer for the new season of the show. I was 20 when this happened. The worst of it was that my mental health was seriously affected by the quality of the show. When it started to get bad, it genuinely made my mental health worse. That might sound like an exaggeration to people who don't know what it's like, but I promise you it's not. Have you ever been suicidal because a writing choice on a show you like upset you so much? No? Then you're more normal than I am. There are many more examples of this kind of behaviour for me where my various hyperfixations are concerned, but I'll spare myself the shame. Except to tell you that the only reason I started learning Korean was because I hyperfixated on K-dramas so much that I started learning the language via osmosis. So hey, at least it was productive. Usually, however, hyperfixations are the opposite of productive. They make you lose track of time, forget to eat, tune out the world around you, and generally make you less spatially and socially aware. And even if you do know that you're annoying people, you still can't help it. Am I aware that I'm annoying the shit out of you by explaining the intricacies of the K-pop industry for 50 whole minutes? Yes. Can I stop? No. That's part of why I started this YouTube channel, because I wanted a place to talk about my hyperfixations without feeling judged or boring my loved ones to absolute tears. Do you want to know what isn't a hyperfixation? Stalking celebrities. Writing fanfiction. Engaging in fandom. Even like really loving a show. Hell, I've seen people describing cooking a meal as hyperfocusing on a task. No queen, that's just regular focusing. Replacement terms for hyperfixation. Having interests. That's it, really. You have interests. Unless you're posting over a million words to AO3 in under two years and finding a way to make every single thing in your life relate back to them, that's not a hyperfixation. That's just an interest. Word number two. Toxic. Toxic means harmful, unpleasant, or insidious. A toxic person is somebody you don't want to be around because their behaviour consistently negatively affects the people around them. Toxic behaviours are often considered triggering to the people labelling them and can be giant red flags. The problem with toxic in this colloquial context is that it doesn't really have a definition. Toxic as defined in the actual dictionary has a specific meaning, obviously, but calling a person or a relationship toxic is harder to define. Urban Dictionary makes a few attempts. Toxic, adjective used to describe usually a very negative person, that bitch about everything, spread unnecessary hate, or just talk shit about others. That makes sense, I think. Then they have toxic person, a person who goes through every length to make another person feel bad about themselves and make it seem like they are the person who is better. Toxic people are mostly active online, but can also be found in real life. Life. Toxic is also a fitting word for their behaviour because toxic behaviour can spread from person to person. This can then lead to toxic relationships. And here's where the overuse problem comes in. Just because somebody is mean to you once, or slips up, or hell, even if they exhibit a single toxic behaviour, does not automatically make them a toxic person. Toxic has sort of become shorthand for abusive, which I think is getting into dangerous territory, because while some toxic relationships are abusive, a lot of them are simply unviable. 
that person you cut out of your life might have been toxic, and I'm sure we all know at least one toxic person, but that doesn't mean that everybody you meet after them that exhibits one or more of their behaviours is equally toxic. Lex Luthor is bald, that doesn't mean that every bald man I come across is a supervillain. We're far too quick to call something or someone toxic. It has the same energy as people on Reddit going, GET A DIVORCE if somebody's partner does something that isn't perfect. Like, yeah, sometimes the Iranian yogurt isn't the issue, and they should get divorced, but most of the time it's stuff that could be fixed with, like, communication. Replacement words for toxic. Meanie. Seriously, think about what it would feel like to call a person a meanie instead of toxic. If they're actually toxic, they'll probably react very badly, which is good to know. And if they're not, they'll probably take it to heart. Rude. Another good one. Turn toxic behaviour into idiot behaviour. Toxic relationship into couple I don't want to be around. Or I don't think this person is right for me. Iranian yoghurt couple. Iranian yoghurt behaviour. Reddit behaviour. And finally, Redditor. It's a red flag if ever I've heard one. Word number three. Love bombing. Now, here is an actual toxic behaviour because it's literally an abuse tactic. Love bombing is the action or practice of lavishing someone with attention or affection, especially in order to influence or manipulate them. It is something that abusers do to confuse their victims because somebody who loves you that much would never hurt you. Would they? It's a vile tactic and one that I have first-hand experience with, so let me tell you that some of the stuff I see people labelling as love bombing on the internet is frankly insane. Love bombing is not complimenting somebody hitting on somebody, being nice without an obvious reason, being overly affectionate at the beginning of a relationship, being a fan of somebody and posting about it without even having direct contact with that person. That is actually a thing I saw someone accuse somebody of love bombing for. Like, you remember that TikTok scandal last year with West Elm Caleb where a bunch of women found out they'd been seeing the same guy who later ghosted them? It all got very out of control very quickly, but one of the things that TikTok was alleging about this guy was that he was love bombing these women, and like, no. That's not what he was doing. He was flirting with his Tinder matches because he wanted to get in their pants. It would only be love bombing if he wanted them to hang around so he could continue to exercise control over them, which he obviously didn't because he kept ghosting these women. According to an article in Elite Daily, dating Caleb looks something like this. Even before your first date, text conversations with Caleb are a nearly continuous stream of witty back and forth messages and sweet compliments. He sends over a playlist titled Furniture Boy, and you find it self-deprecating in the most charming way. It's full of songs from The Doors, The Smiths, and Morrissey. He texts you after your first date to ask when you can see each other again, and you go to the Met together. Later that night, he sends you a candid picture he took of you admiring the art completely unprompted. After three dates, he randomly mentions that he has already deleted his dating app, implying a certain degree of commitment and exclusivity. A few weeks in, you're still texting every day, and he says he can't see his life without you in it. Now, is this shitty behaviour? Absolutely. Is it love bombing? No. It's just a man doing things out of a playbook in the exact same way to every woman he wants to get into the pants of because he knows it works. It can only be love bombing if he then tries to string these women along for months and years at a time, exhibiting controlling and abusive behaviours over them. Should you be wary of somebody who seems all in with you immediately on a dating app? Of course. Strangers are strangers, and some of them aren't to be trusted. But that's just basic self-preservation instincts. If somebody's overly affectionate behaviour is giving you the ick, you should either address that with them to figure out why, or trust your instincts and bail. Okay, here's the deal. When life gives you lemons, just say fuck the lemons and bail. Replacement terms for love bombing. Douchebag alert. Behaviour that gives me the ick. Overly flirty. Uncomfortable amount of affection. West Elm vibes. Potential red flag. And finally, gross. Word number four, and in a similar vein to the previous one, trauma dumping. This one is a bit trickier because sometimes it's an abusive behaviour and sometimes it's the behaviour of somebody who has been abused. Trauma dumping is defined as unloading traumatic experiences on others without warning or invitation. It's often done to seek validation, attention or sympathy. Abusers can use trauma dumping in a similar way to love bombing where they overshare to their victim so the victim feels bonded to them and almost responsible for them and their happiness because if they ever put a toe wrong, the abuser can cry victim themselves and say, you know I had a terrible childhood, etc etc. On the other hand, abuse victims can sometimes overshare things without realising it, either because they don't realise how bad the situation actually is, or because once they've started they can't stop until they feel they have got it out. And there is a fine line between trauma dumping and a person feeling comfortable enough with you to confide in you, and most of the time that's down to the specifics of the situation. Trauma dumping is not telling somebody a negative thing that has happened to you. It is not, as we found the body discovered, when you simply answer somebody's question about how 
or where you've been with, well, my mum died. Now, maybe if she had elaborated on that and proceeded to spend time detailing how traumatic for her that had been, absolutely. But just answering a question with a single sentence describing why you've been away is not trauma dumping. It's just literally answering a question. And having a go at somebody for doing that is much worse than them bringing the mood down, because now you've brought it down even further by being a colossal asshole. Replacement term for trauma dumping. Explaining yourself. Depressing life updates. Bumming me out. Sadness hours. If you're not a coward, trauma bonding. And, of course, kvetching. And our final word of the day goes to... Cultural Marxism. Oh boy. Now... We're getting into right-wing anti-Semitic conspiracy theory territory here, but something that makes that even more upsetting is that it's starting to become a term thrown around by mainstream right-wing media as if it's a normal thing that exists in the world, and that's why I want to talk about it. You may have seen that last week, as of when filming this, Governor Ron DeSantis defined woke as a form of cultural Marxism. He continued to say, It's about putting merit and achievement behind identity politics, and it's basically a war on the truth. And as that has infected institutions and it has corrupted institutions, you've got to be willing to fight the woke. And added that they've done that in Florida, and we proudly consider ourselves the state where the woke goes to die. Now, I've already discussed the fact that the right-wing misuse of the word woke is something that genuinely enrages me, and also somebody made a much better video on it than I could. But holy fucking shit, you guys. This is bad. Like... Bad, bad. Even Donald Trump has said that he doesn't like the word because half the people using it can't define it. And you know how much I hate being seen to agree with that man. Right-wing nutjobs are using woke to just platform anything they want to say about something they disagree with. LGBTQ rights? Woke. Feminism? Woke. Universal healthcare? Woke. Homeless services? Woke. Being nice to somebody else without expecting something in return? That's a member of the woke mob, folks! They're implementing cultural Marxism and they should be stopped! America's tirade against communism is already weirdly obsessive. See my video on the Hays Code for my spiel about McCarthyism, but in the last five to ten years it's become absolutely terrifying. Marxism isn't totalitarian or oppressive, it's actually trying to be the opposite of that. And a lot of this comes down to America's fundamental individualism and how any ideology that doesn't promote that, that doesn't pretend America is a meritocracy, is evil and undemocratic and unpatriotic and a whole host of other buzzwords that make it sound worse. And the problem is that America's problem is starting to become the world's problem. Cultural Marxism used to be a right-wing dog whistle. If you heard somebody use it, then you'd know they're a nut job and not to be engaged with. But now, especially since the term has proliferated so much online, and now that governors are just literally saying the quiet part out loud on the record and allowing Nazis to protest outside of Disney, I can't believe you're making me root for Disney, the term has started to become mainstream. Sometimes when people use it, they're not alt-right nut jobs. they're just regular right-wing people being swept up in the propaganda around them who don't have the information to understand what it actually means. Because cultural Marxism, as used by Fox News and DeSantis and other right-wing grifters, is being used in the same way as woke doesn't mean anything, except things we don't like. And I don't think I need to tell you that this is getting dangerously close to making fascist ideology mainstream. But just in case it needs saying, this is getting dangerously close to making fascist ideology mainstream. Positioning yourself as a defender of Western civilization against those woke cultural Marxists because they don't like capitalism or the patriarchy and think that trans people should live makes you a fascist. I'm so sorry to tell you this, but if you wholeheartedly believe that cultural Marxism is a threat to you, you are on the wrong side of history, and I suggest picking up a book or two. I don't like leaving my videos on such depressing notes, but I'm so pissed. Nazis are protesting outside Disneyland, and the cops were like, they have a right to free speech. That's not free speech. That's hate speech. It's fascist ideology. When do we start punching Nazis again? Because they're allowed to stomp down on us, but the moment we fight back, we're dangerous and out of control. Look at that LGBT protest that happened in America the other week. We were absolutely in the right, but it was immediately painted as a both sides use violence situation rather than some people trying to tear down basic human rights and other people pushing back against that. I'm just tired, dude. There aren't any replacement terms for cultural Marxism because it's a right-wing conspiracy theory bandied around by nutjobs, but I can tell you this. If you hear those words out of somebody's mouth, you run. You run very far in the opposite direction and you hope that they continue to be the minority because if they don't, we're really in trouble. I can't believe DeSantis is making me root for Disney with my Marxist anti-capitalist ass. Disgusting. God, I hope I was in focus for this one. I recorded like 
I'm not even kidding, like half of my blonde video and then realized I was out of focus the entire time. So had to do that again. Also, if you can see that there's some red staining around my lips from where I like just filmed the idol video and rubbed lipstick off my lips. No, you don't. No, you don't. I hope that you're all, um, you're all doing well. Um, I hope that being a cultural Marxist isn't too hard for all of us. I hope my videos aren't, aren't, aren't too depressing. If you have any other words that you think I need to cover, let me know. If you, um, if you have any other video topics that you think uh, I would be able to cover, let me know. Like I'm always, I'm always looking for more ideas. I mean, I obviously have like a list of my, of my own, but like if you, if you think that there's something in particular I'd be interested in, absolutely comment it. I would love to see it. This is editing Talis just popping in to say a quick thank you to all of you who have suddenly showed up over the past like 10 days since my idol video came out and since my John Green video ran picked up steam it's it's really nice to have you here um I don't really know what to say it's it's really weird and very exciting and um I'm about to break 2,000 subscribers which I might have done by the time I post this I don't know most of you have appeared within the last week and it's it's been really surreal watching that happen but I'm really I'm really grateful um, I do have a few more videos in the works and I will be making a follow-up to the idol video I promise I'm gonna wait till the finale though and I'm, I'm gonna just do one big retrospective on the whole show because if I think if I have to make a video about every single episode that'll be my 13th reason so I refuse but I will be making a follow-up video um, for the finale so it'll probably be quite long might be a bit of a monster so hopefully you will all be willing to tune in for that um, if not I have plenty of other videos and other topics if you have suggestions for video topics if you want to see me review more shows if you want to see me do less political content um, let me know I read all the comments so genuinely thank you so much for showing up and subscribing, commenting, liking. It means the world to me. Thank you. Yeah, I just, I hope that you're all doing okay. I hope that things aren't too, too upsetting at the moment. Things are, things are rough, but hopefully uh, things will improve. I don't know. I'm, I'm 24 and working class and I don't even know how to, how to function right now. So I, I, I don't have any answers. All I can do is keep showing everybody the problem, I guess. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Annyeong.